come from an industry that's highly competitive, one where your, your main competitors reside in Asia and tend to just replicate what the next one does. And, you know, it becomes a spiral to who can reach the bottom first in terms of price and you end up making no profitability. And a good example of that would be, you know, launching a generic product in the US that might hold a, a $5 billion market value before patent expiry. And then you get a plethora of generics coming in because they're all looking at the five billion, but you know, they're all cutting each other's price. And by the time you're finished with that molecule, you're down to, you know, $2 billion and, and gross margins that are in the negative terrain. So, you know, that's sort of traditionally the type of industry that we've had to compete in. And the only way you're going to survive and grow in that type of industry is, is if you innovate. And I think the first thing we had to look at is, you know, what, what can we do that can't be easily replicable? What can, you know, what can people not replicate? And we had to look at our capabilities and there, there was very little or no R&D capability in South Africa. So we had a look at our strengths and said, well, where do Aspen strengths lie? And we had some strength in manufacturing and a very big strength for us was our relationship with these multinational R&D based companies. And we said, well, if those are the two advantages that we've got, how do we best exploit those advantages to innovate and turn ourselves into a company where you're not going to have the day you launch a product, 500 generics on your doorstep the very next day. So we had to look at, you know, how we could leverage those two things. And, and we started looking at what these multinationals had in their portfolios. And they had, they had what they call tail end products, typically the way these big R&D companies work. And these R&D companies are companies that have got market caps. If you put two or three of them together, their market caps would be the size of South Africa's total GDP. And that's what, you're talking, that's what you're looking at. So you look at a GSK or a Merck or a Novartis, and they might have a portfolio of products that is, to, is doing, you know, 20 or $30 million worth of revenue. And their entire focus is on the blockbuster product, which by definition is something that does over a billion US dollars. And that's where they're putting all their focus. Start looking at that and saying, well, you know, is there a way of leveraging that 20 or $30 million, which is not really going to make a huge difference to Merck? If, you know, if they sell off or license off 20 or $30 million, it's not going to make a big, huge difference in their lives. And that's kind of how we got into starting to differentiate ourselves. We started doing these licensing and eventually started acquiring these products from them. And you then start developing a niche in in certain speciality areas. And a very good example of this, um, a, a deal we did, or two deals in fact that we did in parallel three years ago, and that probably best illustrates the innovation I'm talking about, when you don't have much R&D and you're relying on relationships and manufacturing. There's a, there's a company that Merck owned in the Netherlands that was manufacturing raw material, and then GSK at the same time had a portfolio of th uh, thrombolytic products, anticoagulants, injectable anticoagulant products. So they were looking to divest this, and the portfolio did, I think, around $120 million or there, there or thereabouts. Not big for their massive for Aspen. So you add, you know, three or $420 million, and, you know, you've got a billion dollars in revenue eventually. So we, we kind of looked at this and said, well, why are they, why are GSK selling is selling because the margins were so bad and they were acquiring the raw material from Merck and they were paying a royalty back to Merck. So we, we found an interest in both of these companies. The market couldn't work this out. So why is Aspen going into raw materials? And, and, and the reason was quite simple because by buying the raw material facility, we were also able to buy the GSK products, cancel the royalty agreement, and then we were able to start manufacturing the raw material. And the raw material for these thrombolytic products comes from the mucosa of pigs. The technical. And I'm not going to take you through the gory detail, but um, it's a very sophisticated, unique technology that not many people can replicate. And then we said, well, if we're owning 
part of the raw material, the intermediates, where do the intermediates come from? And we sort of, uh, my, my boss, Stephen Sard, was Googling the one day just to try and find out where they come from. And it comes from a company in Sioux City in the US. And who owns the company? It's a doctor. It's listed, at, I think, as the wealthiest doctor. Forbes, I think he's worth $14 billion. And you Google a bit more, and you find out that he was uh, a VITS graduate. And he came from Port Elizabeth. So you take your chances and you send off an email to him and say, well, you know, would you consider selling your business? Would you do it for Port Elizabeth? You expect no response from the guy. <laughs> I mean, it's a flyer. You don't expect him to respond. And lo and behold, within 30 minutes, he responds. Eventually, you've got the whole backward integration. Now, it's not easy to replicate that because, like I said, it's a mutazov. It's very sophisticated technology. But what it did is virtually overnight it catapulted Aspen into the third biggest injectable thrombolytic player globally. What does that mean? That means that any time there's a thrombolytic agent that an R&D company wants to, to offload or a multinational wants to, you know, no longer court to their business, the likelihood's pretty strong they're going to come to you. And, the, and Novartis did that and we acquired a further product called Thromba Embolex, and that's how we secured. We're now in position two, got a 13% value share globally in the injectable thrombolytic market. It's, it's a $10 billion market. $10 billion is about two and a half times the size of the whole South African pharmaceutical market, to put it into context. And so we've only got 13% share, and so no fee are the biggest, the French giant, have around a 59% share. But We've got them firmly in our sights. So I think, Nick, it's that type of innovation that you've got to look at.